Hi, I'm Weston Labar. I'm with Cargomatic, and welcome to People on the Move. Very happy today to have our new mayor in the city of Long Beach, Rex Richardson. Rex, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. So Rex was just elected this year. You're in your That's first right. 100 days. You have That's an aggressive right. agenda. You're out and about. So we're happy that you could carve some time out and talk about ports, Long Beach. Of As we all know, you have a, a really good history in the industry with your time on the mm -hmm. Southern California Association of Governments, understanding the roadways, the mm -hmm. freeways, how that all works, yeah. sitting on the South Coast Air Quality Management District and being on the Marine Ports Committee. And then, you know, I've known you since you were Chief of Staff for Steve Neal, who's That's now right. on the Harbor Commission, That's and right. you were City Council Member, Vice Mayor multiple times. Right. And here we are, the youngest mayor in the history of Long Beach. Uh, not the youngest. <laughs> not the okay. Youngest. But nonetheless, thank you for coming. And yeah. tell us a little bit about you, why you wanted to be mayor, and, and what's going on right now in the city. Well, I mean, as you uh, give that, in, that introduction, it's a lot like Game of Thrones, you know, first of his name, the king of the <laughs> Andals. And, you know, I'm doing the same thing I was doing when, when we met, went back when I was 26 as chief of staff to Steve Neal. I've spent every day these last 13 years just working hard to make a difference in my city. And it's public service. I've always valued public service, you know, from my time as student body president in college, my time learning firsthand from Leon Panetta, Chief of Staff to Bill Clinton about the value of public service and seeking careers in public service. And now I get the chance to be the mayor of my city. And we're a great city. We have a lot of opportunities and assets like you. I chose Long Beach to be my home. And we find that people continue to choose Long Beach. And the challenge today is most major American cities are dealing with big challenges that relates to the rising cost of housing and uh, livability in cities that are making people rethink that choice. And so the big challenge that I have as a mayor through a recovery, a mayor sort of three years out of a crisis on, you know, three or four fronts from, from health to economics, to social justice, to housing, we have to chart a future for our city. One that is inclusive and inviting, one that people feel like they can belong and they can afford to belong. Mm -hmm. uh, one that uh, business can thrive, that the things that have worked for us for a long time can thrive, like goods movement, logistics, supply chain, and our ports. And one that ensures that the next 10 years does better from an equity standpoint, from an environmental standpoint than we did in the previous 10 years. And so that's the charge of the new mayor. Here in Long Beach, that 10 years kind of, it, uh, it's interesting because we're in 2023 now. I'm in office, you know, a couple months. In 10 years, it'll be obviously 2033. And the midpoint is 2028, when the Olympics will come mm -hmm. to Southern California and Long Beach will be a host city. We're hosting six events today. The plan is to host six events. And so the midpoint of this 10 years is the Olympics. So I'm thinking in terms of BO before Olympics and AO after <laughs> Olympics. What are the investments we can make? What picture are we painting? What story are we telling about Long Beach when we host the world? And how do we capitalize on the investments over the next five years, the story that we tell over the next five years to ensure that Long Beach maintains its status and, and enhances its status as an international leader, a national leader on goods movement, a place that has always been welcoming to, to refugees, to immigrants, to people who choose Long Beach, how can we make sure that they continue to do so? And so that's my charge as mayor. Yeah, no, and, and you hit on so many things. And you know, I share so many of the same perspectives, working with the United Cambodian community now right. for a decade. You know, it's really about giving back and figuring out how all the different components fit together. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about Long Beach, and most people don't know this, but Long Beach is the only major city on the waterfront in California between San Diego and San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes unfortunately overshadowed by our, our large, large metropolis to the north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have a thriving aerospace right. community. We have a thriving healthcare community. Right. We have this, I mean, this is a port city. It's the That's second right. largest or third largest port in the country, part of the largest port complex in the Western Hemisphere. Right with the ability to become the largest port in the country with mm -hmm. some of the infrastructure investments that have been made. But before we hop into the port and where mm -hmm. we're going, you know, I think 
the things that you highlighted show your approach to this. And, and I just wanted to say one of the things I've always a, a enjoyed about our relationship is whether we agree or disagree, we can always right. have a good conversation. Right. We can leave friends, right. you know, the conversation start and end with a handshake and a hug. And you've done such a great job of trying to understand the issues, whether it's as a council member, whether it's as part of a staffer for a council member or part of your duties with AQMD or SCAG, mm -hmm. you've always wanted to understand what's the business perspective, what's the right. community impact, what's the environmental impact, how does labor fit in, all the different mm -hmm. things that not everybody wants to do. And just talk a little bit about what you've learned in this sure. first 100 days, because you've literally went out and met with almost everybody. And yeah. the last thing I would say is, is, as we look at the port, you're looking at, I love the way you said that 2028, because you're really looking at, we've got great things. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we take it to the next level? Right. And that's what we're doing in supply chain. Mm -hmm. We've got a great thriving port here. Mm -hmm. We've got a country that needs a better supply chain, a more efficient supply chain. Yeah. So we've developed technology to try to create connectivity everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of doing the same thing here in the city. I think you nailed it. I mean, people have high expectations of government in general. And in local government, that's where the rubber meets the road. You actually have to deliver. And right now, local government has more challenges than we've ever had in local government. But, you know, I'm an optimist. There's also significant opportunities in local government. And throughout the years, my service philosophy over time has developed into finding consensus and delivering progress. And if you deliver progress, that begets further progress. But how you deliver that progress and find consensus is finding the areas where the most interests intersect. So when you can have business and community and labor and environmental groups and governments, opportunities for alignment, you spend your first dollars there, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're gonna get a much bigger bang for your buck by investing where you find alignment. And then after that, once you create a culture of yes, once you, once you exercise that muscle of consensus, because it's a muscle, once you exercise it, you can take on bigger things you can begin to take on more significant challenges. And so based on that, that's how I'm beginning my administration. The first 100 days, I've branded as the Opportunity Beach Agenda. What are the opportunities that we have mm -hmm. over the next 100 days that ultimately sets up for the first year, the first term, and this decade? Over the course of the next decade, and if I have the good fortune to be elected, you know, three full terms as mayor, in Long Beach, that would be 12 years. I have, and we both have little ones. You know, my youngest daughter's five. So in 12 years, she'll be graduating high school. She's a kindergarten now. When we frame our priorities based on the next generation and youth, you build a whole lot of consensus. How can we make sure that there are economic opportunities? What commitments can we make to jobs, full employment? That there's housing opportunities that no young person under 26 has to ever experience homelessness in our city. What commitments can we make to education? Long Beach has been committed to the Long Beach College Promise where if you just simply go to school here and you meet the, the, the basic college preparatory standards, you can go to Long Beach State or you can get two years free at Long Beach City College. But what are the additional covenants that we can keep over the next decade to air quality, economics, housing, culture, inclusion, belonging. That's where I'm thinking, right? So this Opportunity Beach agenda starts with a lot of consensus building. I've committed to doing, meeting with 100 businesses in the first 100 days. We're probably in day 60 something and we're probably at about 150 businesses we've sat down with already. We've also made a commitment to growth, a strategy called the Grow Long Beach agenda, which really looks at over the next decade, what investments can we make today to really boost our growth? because it's an economic imperative that we do so. Over the course of the next decade, we know that one of the commodities that Long Beach has been fortunate to have and balance our budget based on has been the production of fossil fuels in our, in our city. Long Beach for the last century has been an oil province, right? We actually are an oil operator. Mm -hmm. We're an oil company as a city. And what's abundantly clear based on you know, discussions in the state legislature is that in California, Oil may be California's past, but it's not California's future. And so how can we as a city prepare for that transition to make sure we protect jobs, to make sure that we untangle our revenue sources and become less dependent on that revenue stream? How can we create opportunities out of this? And so the Grow Long Beach agenda 
essentially says, let's invest in what we know works. These five industries aren't going anywhere. One is port supply chain, good movement trade. It's not going anywhere. When we created a, a port more than 100 years ago, we still had horse-drawn carriages. We didn't know we would have the second largest port in America at the time and be a part of the largest seaport in the Western Hemisphere, as you, as you stated. So it's not going anywhere. So as we invest in that port, into electrification, into goods movement, zero, zero emissions, how can we prioritize development and projects that help boost the city's bottom line? We tax energy in our city. And so when people plug up that truck or when they plug up that ship, we benefit. We mm -hmm. hire police officers and firefighters. So how can we align our growth strategy with the port's development strategy? Tourism is big for our city. You mentioned it. Only downtown on the waterfront between San Diego, San Francisco, with significant opportunities for development. That is a huge growth opportunity for us. Education. We're a college town. Go Beach. Right on our border, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Go Toros. And we've got two campuses from Long Beach City College. Go Vikings. How can we, over the next decade, continue to make sure our educational institutions thrive and reorient them into our downtown since we know office space is not being utilized in the same way as it was prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so how can we restore our downtown, rethink our downtown by bringing more families and students into our downtown? Healthcare is a big sector for us. We're fortunate that we have not only hospitals, but health plans in Long Beach that are all facing challenges. How do we address those challenges and make sure that they continue to be an asset to our communities? Because when people locate here, they're thinking about what healthcare infrastructure is in place if I move my family to Long Beach. As your children grow, what healthcare infrastructure is in place? And we know that those are good quality union jobs. So those are industries that we're really excited about. I would say one of the biggest that we're probably very excited about, most, most excited about at this point, is this emerging space sector that we have in Long Beach. Over the last Coming out of our years, DNA of aerospace, like right. this is an aerospace city. Right. This is a, we talk about history, it was 100 years ago this year that we you know, designated Long Beach Airport. We created the first airport. People were utilizing the beach to take off and land, a very <laughs> long beach. And we designated an airport 100 years ago this year. And now, all of that aviation history from production of the C-17, World War II, all of that production during all that time has set the stage for us to take on the next state, next generation, which is space. We're developing rockets. We have the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing space clusters in America here in Long Beach. We went from 2 million square feet of space, dedicated space real estate to 7 million in about five years. And so we're, we're rapidly expanding. We're 3D printing rockets. We're building the, you know, the first artificial gravity space station is being built in Long Beach. And so, you know, these are the growth sectors that we as a city need to make investments in and cultivate over the next decade to really show what a climate forward, climate sustainable economy can look like in a major American city. Yeah. And all great industries, but I'm going to focus on one today. And you Let's know that it. that's Absolutely. supply chain. And, and there's two things I want to start with. And, and I, want to, I want to come back to, but I want to mention quickly, the transition that you talk about from being an oil economy to being an energy economy, right? right? Because when we talked about that first, I had that aha moment of people always saying, well, it's an oil economy. The budget's built on oil. And you said, yeah. but not if we do this. And I want to come back to that because mm -hmm. it all starts with what you first said, consensus. Right. And if there's something that, that you've done extremely well throughout your whole career, and it's something you and I have worked on together at times, it's, it's coalition building. That's right. And the, one of the big hallmark announcements recently was not just about big developments and infrastructure opportunities that the port's doing, but a 10-year project right. labor agreement. This is a hallmark moment. Mm -hmm. It's groundbreaking and pun intended, but you don't see that anywhere else. And it's important for a couple reasons. One, you've got that consensus that mm -hmm. you're talking about. Two. We all know California has a lot of environmental red tape, which is not a bad thing if you know how to do it, but the city's done a great job of creating like the downtown plan, creating master development. So actually working with the union and the, and the port and other folks to try to create shovel ready projects, mm -hmm. which allows us to compete for state and federal dollars. That's so right. talk a little bit about what that means to the city, to the port and really to the future. Yeah, I, I think it's, because we have such a complex and shifting legislative environment, the more we can get people on the same page, the better. All a project labor agreement does is establish the terms right up front. There's nothing to negotiate. 
Now we know as we take advantage of some of the funding that this president has deployed to local government by way of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and very soon the Inflation Reduction Act, we're going to be able to invest in our port to a significant extent and to the west part of our town on climate friendly infrastructure. And so as we think about these investments, we can now quantify with some degree of specificity what's the impact ec economically, how many jobs we will create, construction jobs, what percentage of those will come to our local communities in Long Beach. And we don't have labor conflicts on a PLA project. So with doing business in cities, a lot of times people's biggest concern is ease, speed, and predictability. With the project labor agreement, you have predictability as it relates to cost and timelines, production schedule or construction schedule. And so it makes a whole lot of sense to be a city that believes in agreements so that we can focus on production, focus on development. And so we have now this 10 year project labor agreement. We're proud of that. We also have a project labor agreement in the city of Long Beach on city projects. And we, now that we have that, we can align with our institutions like Long Beach City College to make sure that we're doing the pre-apprenticeships, doing the training to make sure our workforce is prepared for the construction jobs over the next decade. That's what people expect when they think of local government delivering. And what's so great now is as we move forward, going back to the, the transition, really, what, what's Long Beach's future? Right. One of, the, one of the big things is not just going to be the bricks and mortar, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a new bridge that's great. Right. We continue to make great our- Great bridge, terrible name. Yeah. <laughs> we continue to make our port deeper waters, higher cranes, yeah. all that fun stuff. We've got the Pier B rail project that's going to allow us to use more train, right. get to more on-dock rail, which mm -hmm. we partner with a lot of the railroads. So for us, we like to see that. We want to localize trucking. We don't want, we, we don't, as, yeah. a, as a strategy, want to see trucks drive all over the place. We want to see things moving to and from nodes, right? And use things like trains mm -hmm. to be more efficient. But it's not just that hard infrastructure in that way anymore. There's two other parts of it. It's digital infrastructure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's the energy infrastructure. And that's a big part of our future. So again, talk a little bit about that transition because I don't think people realize it's not just a climate strategy, it's a business strategy for the city. 100%, I mean, look, we have a need to address climate challenges, air quality, environmental challenges. We also have a need to maintain our competitive advantage as a West Coast deep channel port. And so we have to be interested in the business of innovation, climate innovation, technology goods movement. A part of this Grow Long Beach strategy is the Launch Beach Challenge, which is we've challenged, we've issued a challenge to recruit 100 startups, technology, software startups that can help us overcome our challenges as a city, these climate challenges, these logistical challenges, as well as boosting these five growth sectors. And so already since issuing the challenge, one group, a capital group called Sunstone, mm -hmm. set aside $25 million to help support the effort. And so over the course of the next five years, we and hired it. the city's economic development Absolutely. manager to come Absolutely. or director to come and right. do this because they, be wanted that, this. they wanted that DNA. Right. And so they've answered the, answered the challenge I issued at the state of the city already by laying down capital and helping them build a coalition around driving that. What does that mean for us? That means Long Beach will be helping to develop and support clean technology infrastructure and software like what you're doing here at Cargomatic that can help not only make processes better, but it helps us maintain our advantage here on the West Coast. And then as infrastructure becomes freed up through this, through this transition on fossil fuels, what does the future opportunities look like? Is there opportunity to do offshore wind on the West Coast? Is there opportunities for energy islands at our port? What's the future of Thumbs Island and the oil islands in Long mm -hmm. Beach, right? Are we going to be landing and taking off helicopters from there? Are we going to be shooting off rockets from there in the future? Who knows? But we have to be concerned about the business of the future. It's, mayors have to have the uncanny ability to, to be present in the future while they're present in today. They have to be envisioning what, what you want the future to look like and help galvanize people around that vision, right? And so that's one of the most exciting parts about being mayor is that we, we get to be con concerned about and forging uh, a better future. So you leave it, you leave your community in better hands and a better condition 
than it was when you found it. Yeah, and to put that in business terms, you're the CEO, the city councils, your board of directors, or maybe your top advisors, right? Mm -hmm. And then the people of Long Beach, they're your shareholders. At the end you're of the day, absolutely right. if, you, if they like what you're doing to invest right. in their future, and they think they're gonna get great dividends out of this, right. you're gonna get reelected. If not, they say, let's go find a new CEO. You have to deliver results in local government, just like in the private sector. So, so as we talk about Long Beach and the ports, you know, a little bit your, your background. So mm -hmm. I think it goes really well into what you're doing because it's not like you jumped into this blindly, right? right. You, you've spent years, again, on the city council. But mm -hmm. what I really want to talk about is the time mm -hmm. you spent with SCAG and AQMB. Because yeah. unlike, you know, not everybody, it's a, it's a volunteer role. You have to take right. this very seriously. You volunteer to do these things, huge time commitments. So talk a little bit about, because a lot of what Long Beach is doing is because the state and, and even regional regulators are saying, this is the vision for the future. And you have to figure out how to align with that in a way right. that the, the city wins, the right. region wins. So talk right. a little bit about what you learned from that experience and, and, sure. and, and what you're gonna implement yeah. moving forward. Look, I mean, we're all a sum of all of our experiences, right? When I got into local government as a chief of staff at 26, most of my experience had been on a college campus, at student body president, Cal State Dominguez Hills, organizer in the labor movement, a Democratic Party organizer. So I'd done a lot of organizing, community work. And then when I came into city government, I found a space that I was passionate about, helping to make a meaningful difference in people's lives by getting the government to be more efficient and more responsive to those communities. And I learned that in local government, you can, it's again, it's where the rubber meets the road, but it's also where you can manifest change faster than any other level of government. And so I, I jumped right in. I wanted to absorb everything. When I joined the city council, and I was the youngest council member in history, not the youngest mayor. That's where I get right. it a little. So when I joined the city council, I had a hunger of learning about the region. There were priorities we had in my own community and in our city that we didn't have the support or the expertise to focus on. And so out of, it was an economic imperative and an, it was an imperative for me to get involved in regional government. So first it was Southern California Association of Governments. I got involved in this agency. It's the largest metropolitan planning agency in America. They, you know, 191 cities, 19 million people across six counties. They're responsible for the long range transportation planning for the region and housing planning for the region and sustainability planning for the region. Every federal funded project has to be in our regional transportation plan that's updated by this agency. And so you learn about the diverse ecosystem. I had the opportunity to serve as president and serve on the board for four years of this agency where at a very interesting time when the pandemic happened and we had to allocate the new regional housing needs assessment and assign 100 like 1.3 million housing units across these 191 jurisdictions we met we landed that with almost a unanimous vote right so you learn about these regional constraints how we plan for a healthier region while making decisions locally in your cities right all of those experiences i brought in to my role as as mayor I understand I have responsibility to my constituents, but I also understand Long Beach's regional leadership as not only a large city in population, but where we're situated right at the port, right at the south end of the river, the largest city in our gateway region. We have to show leadership on a whole hist host of issues from housing to homelessness, social issues, economic challenges. What we do in Long Beach, it spreads across the region. If we pass a policy, if we work together and we get it right, Los Angeles, cities across the region, they may adopt those policies as well. And so we have to be strategic leaders about how we solve these challenges. The other thing I'll say is I also like to bring in personal experiences, right? I didn't grow up rich. I moved on, I moved around a lot as a kid. I went to 14 public schools across five states. My father was in the Air Force. I was born in Scott Air Force Base in Belleville, Illinois. And my mother was a welder for General Motors. And so she was a real Rosie the Riveter. When my mother and father divorced, we moved around a lot. She ultimately retrained and got her class A truck driver's license, right? And her, and her husband, uh, my stepfather's been a truck driver for many, many years. And so when I see that goods movement and trucking provides opportunities for people at every stage of their life, that makes me uniquely concerned about making sure that those small truck, trucking operators have the opportunities to drive quality equipment with clean air, have the safety standards that they need and the economic opportunities to do business close to home. And so, I think I have that appreciation for our industry from a different standpoint, given that, you know, it's that in your blood. It's, 
<laughs> it wouldn't be great to be in your blood, but I would say it's in my DNA. Yeah, we, we have that saying, our, our CEO, he grew up in the business, and, yeah. and as he says, it's like, it's in my blood. I just, yeah. I love transportation, yeah. but I was born that way, right? Right. So there's, there's two more things I just want to touch on. One is you, you talked about, we talked about the movement forward environmentally. We mm -hmm. talked about the infrastructure at the port, mm -hmm. uh, but obviously the port only works if the, the infrastructure around the port is able to help move the goods off and move the goods on. You know, we're making investments in clean trucks. We operate near zero emission, emissions trucks now. Right. We're getting zero emissions ready. We're, we're building that terminal. What can we do to help these small private companies get into cleaner equipment faster? Yeah. Because, you know, the infrastructure is the key. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. to say batteries, everything we've ever done, whether it was the brick phone now, to the, it gets better, faster, cheaper over time. Right. But you still need to plug it in somewhere. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk a little bit about that from a public's perspective, whether it's permitting for private businesses, whether it's public infrastructure in or outside of the port. I think it's a sum of all of those parts. I think, you know, our ports need to invest in public charging infrastructure and they need to create the pathways for private charging infrastructure. If someone were to carry a load from, you know, from Long Beach, California, out to Fontana and from Fontana out to Dallas Fort Worth with a load of chicken, you know, they're gonna have to fuel up a number of times. Well, for that load to still happen, you still have to charge up. So the infrastructure is needed 10, 20, 40. You need that infrastructure. But it starts right here in the ports. There's 6,000 trucks that unique trucks every day in our port, 21,000 trips in and out of the port every day. And that's a lot of energy, right? That's an asset. That's a commodity for us. We have to accelerate from a public policy standpoint and a funding standpoint, the deployment of charging infrastructure. Then we know that the trucks we've had the, you know, we've, we've heard for so long that the, the trucks just aren't there. They're not ready. I'm sorry, friend. They're delivering orders right now. They're taking orders. The biggest truck manufacturers are taking orders today. It is, you know, you can, trucks can be delivered within the next one or two years and it will take time to align the funding. So we have to make sure that the ports and the AQMDs and the cars are allowing their funding to be layered together because some of these trucks may cost as much as a half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And the average small operator will not be able to afford it unless they can layer resources together and have it a way where, they, where it's seamless and easy to apply for. Because if you're a small trucking company, you probably have one or two employees. Yep. And those employees are probably doing your log books and they're doing, you know, uh, yeah, trust me, I, I get it. They're doing they all the They could be driving clients. mobile officers. They, they're doing, they have probably have one or two back office people booking loads, you know, making sure they're on top of all the reporting, all the trip paperwork, which is a lot of work. So if they have to focus on getting that person to go and navigate this complex network of funding in order to deliver one truck, they're going to say, I'm going to leave a diesel one. I'm going to go to Texas and buy another diesel truck for 50,000 bucks. And I'm going to just do trips from right outside the California border out to Florida or, and we're not going to get the environmental benefits that we want. And we're going to alienate those small companies. And so we have challenges in local government. We have challenges in the state government to make sure that this process is seamless. And we're all working together with that. Again, like where our interests intersect those common goals, but I see some opportunities. I mean, when mayors can work together and say, this is what we want to do, I think that's good. I think when you have a federal government, and we do, with the Biden administration has deployed more resources local government than any other administration in history. And it's really up to us to make sure the plans are in place and entitled and that we're smart in how we go procure those resources to deliver those projects. Yeah, again, it comes down to consensus building, that's right. collaboration and coalition building. That's right. So last thing I want to touch upon quickly, because you've, you've talked to it uh, in a couple different phases of comments today, is workforce development. So mm -hmm. I, I've been very fortunate, I said as the vice chair of the workforce board That's for right. the city, maybe the mayoral real, no, I'm just kidding. But it's a really good honor because you work mm -hmm. with folks on so many different levels in moving forward to the next phase of our economy, mm -hmm. training, retraining, apprenticeship programs. And so often we hear, about all the job openings folks have, but they can't find the qualified worker. Right. There's a disconnect there. And I know this is something from way back in the day, near and dear to your heart. So just talk a little bit outside of the, the Long Beach College Promise, which is great, but, mm -hmm. but what you guys are doing at the city level on the apprenticeship side, on the workforce right. development side. Look, we've, 
you know, we've got, we're fortunate that we have educational institutions like Long Beach City College, Long Beach State, and Cal State Dominguez Hills. These are some of the best institutions for social mobility. Cal State Dominguez Hills was ranked number one educational institution for social mobility. We have programs at Long Beach City College that align you directly with apprenticeship programs. In the city, we're government jobs. Well, guess what? A government job can transform your life. I was given an opportunity at 26 to come and work for the city of Long Beach. It allowed me as a young man to come down, put down roots, you know, get married on the Long Beach waterfront, have my two daughters at Long Beach Memorial, you know, be a homeowner here. Married to a now doctor. Right, exactly. Put down roots because we have the stability of a public Mm -hmm. job. There's four or 500 more vacant opportunities right now to be a city employee. That's 500 opportunities to change and transform lives. You know, when we talk about public employment, a lot of times people uh, may forget the power of being a refuse operator or a street sweeper operator, the garbage man. I love the play fences, the August Wilson play fences. And the father is, he spent his whole life on the back of a garbage truck, but he was able to buy a home, provide for his son, his family. And there are people in our communities today that need to be exposed to those opportunities Mm -hmm. who may not know that it comes with a pension, which is secure retirement is difficult these days. It comes with health care. It comes with the ability to put your children through college. And so we have to get out and sell these opportunities a bit better. I'm proposing a program, an expansion of our public service pathways, which are direct fellowships in the city in partnership with you know, our California programs and our, Ameri- our AmeriCorps programs that will allow people to spend one or two years embedded learning these, these opportunities to where when a public employee position opens up, you know about it, you're familiar with it, and you can go right into that position ready to serve. And so these are the experience, these are the, the opportunities that we're exploring here in the city of Long Beach. Yeah, and we're doing something similar here. We have our own Cargomatic University, which is really for right now for internal onboarding and training, but the vision is much bigger than that, right? And so um, it's so important to give people not just the opportunity, but the Mm -hmm. skills to to take advantage of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to share with us today, Mr. No, I just want to, you know, Weston, it's always a pleasure. Great to see you continuing to serve in this capacity here in our great city. And I'll make sure that, you know, as we move forward on this Opportunity Beach agenda, our Grow Long Beach strategy, continue charting the next decade for our city, that we come back and have another conversation. We would love that. And anything Cargomatic can do to help talk about the future, how we can help upskill and rescale, right. how we can innovate and take things mm-hmm. to the next level. I mean, we're doing it. And, uh, and we want to be part of that change, that, that progress, as you talked about. All so right. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Pleasure having you.